Today we're going to be experimenting with some custom built engine controls for our 719cc supercharged Kubota diesel engine that powers our Honda Insight. Up to this point, the Kubota D722 diesel engine has exceeded all expectations as far as performance and fuel economy goes. And we feel, with a few more tweaks, this car may actually be a contender for daily driver status. Let's take a look at how we plan on making the car more drivable in an urban environment. So this guy is a linear boost controller, or linear blow-off valve. I really don't know what to call it, but in theory it should help regulate the boost generated by the AMR500 supercharger. Now this guy over here, it's an electronic fuel rack limiter and its purpose is to keep the governor from briefly slamming the fuel rack wide open when the car is driven under a light to medium load. Yeah, this little diesel engine has a nasty habit of letting out a puff of smoke or two under light acceleration and that's because we've manually adjusted the fuel rack limit to exceed the factory calibrated limit. This gizmo has been completely redesigned several times now in order to get it to fit in the limited space we have to work with. Now that we got it to fit, well, it'll be interesting to see if it works. Both the boost controller and the fuel rack limiter are intended to work automatically, but at this point in the development, we've set them up to have manual controls, and both gizmos are initially going to be controlled with this simple interface. The knob on the right will directly control the boost controller. If I rotate the knob clockwise to 100%, well, that'll send 100% of the boost the supercharger's generating to the engine. And if I spin the knob counterclockwise to perhaps 50%, that should unload the supercharger and allow the boost to vent. This knob is not calibrated yet, so the unload position is just a speculation, and we'll figure that out once we drive the car. On the other side of this interface, we have a knob for the fuel rack limiter. If I set the knob to 50%, that will theoretically allow the engine to run exactly the same as it's currently running, because this position was calibrated using the actual fuel rack limiter screw. If I crank the knob to 100%, well, that'll allow the fuel rack to move an extra 2 millimeter and provide the engine with additional fuel for maximum power. And we've never actually run the engine with this much fuel before, so that'll be interesting. Now, if I turn the knob all the way to 0%, well, that will restrict the fuel rack movement. And in theory, this setting is close to how the factory calibrated the engine. So 50% is kind of the base tune, and with a twist of the knob, we can get more performance at the cost of higher exhaust gas temperatures and a visibly dirty exhaust, or we can twist the knob the other way and reduce the exhaust gas temperatures and clean up the exhaust a little bit. Of course, adding boost to the equation helps keep the exhaust clean no matter what. So as you can see, the car is partially disassembled, and it's been this way for the better part of two weeks. Let's take a look under the hood. Right here is where the fuel rack limiter screw is supposed to go, and it's actually an awkward location. Now, keep in mind, all the stuff on the front of the engine has been removed, so it may look like there's plenty of space, but in reality, there's practically zero space once the pulleys, the belts, the front motor mount, all that stuff's in place. There's definitely a lot of junk on this engine, and we're fixing to install more stuff. Anyway, one of the concerns we have is the potential for an oil leak since our rack adjustment gizmo breaches the front of the engine. The good news is we have a way to seal the breach, but is that going to be enough? Well, only time will tell. Let's take a look at our spare engine, and I'll show you how the redesigned part fits. So this bolt with a 3mm hole drill in its center takes the place of the original fuel rack limiter screw. Anyway, for the redesigned gizmo, we need to get rid of this cover and replace it with a custom made cover. This new cover does two things. Well, the first one is it's 1mm thinner and trust me, we need all the space we can get. Plus, it provides a wider mounting base. Now, the reason we need a wider mounting base is, on the previous design, we used this stud to help attach our gizmo. But, getting the nut on this stud with the gizmo in place, well, that's impossible with the engine still in the car. So before the gizmo is installed, we first have to install a nut on this stud, then we can install the gizmo. At this point, the gizmo has been redesigned with a clearance hole in it to clear the nut. But that leaves us with only two mounting points, and that's not enough because, well, the vibrations of the engine will cause this gizmo to flex. So on the other side, we added another mounting point, and that eliminates all the flex in the system. 
So we successfully redesigned this part to provide clearance for everything on the front of the engine. But as it turns out with the engine in the car, this guy comes in contact with the reinforced frame rail in the car. Now keep in mind, this car is made entirely out of aluminum and the chassis has reinforced cast aluminum hard points for the engine and suspension mounts. So modifying the cast aluminum hard points for clearance was not something we wanted to do. Actually, let's fast forward a little bit and you can see the gizmo finally installed in the car and there's clearance for everything. It took two weeks to get to this point, but it wasn't that easy. You see, redesigning the part was straightforward, but when it comes to 3D printing the new part, well, for that you need electricity. And that was something that wasn't available due to a wicked storm that ripped through town. Now, our 212cc Predator-powered El Cheapo generator certainly has more than enough power to run the 3D printer, but I wasn't willing to sit around for 12 or more hours babysitting the generator, so I took a nap instead. Anyway, after a few naps, the power was restored, then it was time to have the robot make my parts. And with the robot working as hard as it could, well, I took another nap. Now, at some point, I did do a little work and the car was reassembled. So after letting the car run for about a half hour, we checked for oil leaks and discovered the rack limiter gizmo was not letting any oil escape the engine, which is awesome. So with the rack limiter and the boost controller installed, it was time to take the car out for a road test. The next concern we have is whether the rack limiter will actually limit the position of the fuel rack. The best way to find out is to set the limiter to zero and this will theoretically limit the fuel rack to factory specifications and will lose quite a bit of power. I reckon the car will still drive fine around town, but once we hit a long stretch of road outside of town, the lack of power will be evident when we try to accelerate at full throttle. So the storm that ripped through this little town was devastating and it took out a lot of trees. The roads appear to have been cleared of most of the sticks and branches, however there's still a lot of rubble here and there. As a matter of fact, this is my second attempt to leave town. The first attempt was unsuccessful due to heavy equipment blocking all the roads. Okay, well let's see how much power this thing has. The transmission's in fifth gear and now I'm gonna floor it and if the gizmo's working, we should max out at around 55 miles per hour and the exhaust gas temp should stay below 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's not good. The car actually has a lot more power, which is the exact opposite of what I was trying to achieve on this test. So after driving the car for a while, I'm convinced the fuel rack limiter is not working as expected, but it is working. You see, when I set the interface to 100%, which is maximum power, I get a big cloud of smoke trailing the car as I go down the road. When I set the interface to 0%, well, I still get a cloud of smoke, but it's a lot less. Hmm. So I fiddled with the boost controller and eh, it works fine. I can set the boost to any pressure I desire. I guess that's sort of interesting. Now, the rack limiter, nope, it ain't working right. All right, we're back at the shop. One of the problems with this fuel rack limiter is there's no way to tell if it's moving when it's commanded to do so. Now, if I put my hand on the stepper motor and turn the dial, I can feel the vibrations from the motor spinning, so I think the gizmo is actually working. It's just not moving the rod far enough. Now, I've searched my video archive, and unfortunately, I can't find a video where I assembled this fuel rack limiter. So in order to help you folks understand what I'm going to do next, perhaps now would be a good time to brief you on the construction of this device. So this, of course, is the assembled fuel rack limiter. The heart of this device is this thing here, and essentially it's a repurposed General Motors idle air control valve, but it's been modified to work in our application. So let's take a closer look at this idle air control valve. If you've watched the previous videos, you know that this is a compact stepper motor that has an internal screwdriver that can move this thingy in and out. 
On this valve, this thing is made from hard plastic and it can be removed with fire. Or, in other words, you can get this thing off by heating it and that'll soften the plastic, but it's a messy process. Anyway, once the plastic tip is removed, it exposes the end of the shaft, which has a 3.5 millimeter thread on it. Now, what I did was, I machined a very small brass coupler. One end was threaded for 3.5 millimeter, and the other end was drilled to 2.97 millimeter for an interference fit with a 3 millimeter stainless steel shaft. The shaft was first pressed into the brass coupler, then the whole thing was assembled using red Loctite. So now you get the basic idea of what's inside this fuel rack limiter. When it's activated, this stainless steel rod will move in or out, and that's how we remotely set the limit of the fuel rack. Now, this gizmo can actually move the rod way more than we need, but I'm not sure how much because this thing has been redesigned so many times, I lost track of how much movement it actually has. You see, there just isn't a lot of space inside this device, and it's built to really tight tolerances. Anyway, I do know that the code I wrote allows 8mm of total movement when this knob is turned from 0 to 100%. I'm thinking we may be able to tweak the code so I can command this rod to move out a few more millimeter. It's a long shot, but I say we give it a try. Okay, so after reviewing the code and doing a few experiments off camera, I found a way we can force the rack limiter to move a little bit more. By changing this number from 7 to 3, we actually change the ratio between the knob on the interface to how much the stepper motor will move the rod on the rack limiter. This will definitely work, but it causes a calculation error in the step counter. Meh, it's just an experiment, and if this hack works, well, we'll know the rack limiter actually is working, and it will validate the design. So let's do that. A simple software hack probably doesn't help you folks understand what the problem is, so let's take a look at a cartoon. This guy is of course the rack limiter, and the problem we're having is the rod is not extending far enough in this direction. For me, this doesn't make sense because I calibrated this gizmo to be a direct replacement for the adjustment screw. So what went wrong? Well, fortunately I do have a video on how this gizmo was calibrated. So this is the calibration rig, and basically it's a flat sheet of aluminum to hold the gizmo and the actual adjustment screw. Now, there is a slight difference between the rod length and the adjustment screw length, but don't focus on that. At the time this was filmed, the gizmo wasn't connected to the controller, and whatever the gizmo was set to is not really important. What is important is the rack limiter was calibrated without the mounting base, and that makes a huge difference. Well, a 2 millimeter difference, and that's more than enough to cause our problem. So the software hack that we did allows the rod to extend this way quite a bit more. But how much more? Well, that's unknown because the inside of this guy, there's a limited amount of space for the shaft coupler to move in and out. And we're just guessing at this point. Now keep in mind, the gizmo is still installed on the engine and I'm using video that was recorded before we installed it on the car. The only way to know for sure is to remove the gizmo and actually check it, but that means taking the car apart again and we ain't doing that right now. So for this test, we're going to dial in about 5 psi of boost, which is about here. Of course, the engine's just idling, but at highway speeds, the gauge should read 5 psi. Now for the rack, we're going to go for maximum restriction, so this knob will remain at zero. Right now, the calibration factors are way out of whack, and we really can't do much more than a low power test. I'm going to validate this experiment by keeping an eye on the exhaust gas temps. If all goes to plan, we should be able to tell if the gizmo is working because the exhaust gas temps will remain at a reasonable temperature. Alright, I guess second time's a charm or something like that. It looks like we have another storm coming in. Hmm. Right away I can tell the car is down on power, and that's awesome! Yeah, I can't believe I just said that. At some point, once we resolve the hardware issue, I'll write some code so the microcomputer can automatically adjust the engine controls for a seamless operation. And theoretically, we can restore the power output of the engine so it's more responsive. The goal is to get this car to blend in with normal traffic without rolling coal every time it accelerates. Plus, I think there's a good chance we may improve the fuel efficiency. Now, just to be clear, fuel efficiency is not the goal of this project, but we can't ignore the fact that this car delivers better than average fuel economy. 
So it's possible, just for fun mind you, that I could write some code that would also maximize fuel efficiency. Now I'm not a big fan of doing stuff like this because it's very Orwellian when the computer takes over and forces the engine to be more efficient. Let me know in the comments if you want me to also push the limits of fuel efficiency. Okay, I just put the car in fifth gear and now I'm going to floor it. If the gizmo is working, we should see colder exhaust gas temps and the smoke from the exhaust should be eliminated. And we should see a reduction in top speed. A quick check in the rear view mirror and there's no cloud of smoke following me, so that's good. The car is definitely picking up speed, but it's taking a while. Now with the accelerator floored, the exhaust gas temps normally go up pretty quick and they can approach the danger zone in about 20 or 30 seconds. Yep, this little diesel engine's not really working hard at all at this point. With five pounds of boost and our gizmo preventing the governor from slamming the fuel rack wide open, it's like the engine's on vacation. This is of course all good news. The exhaust gas temps are holding steady at a reasonable temperature, so no worries there. It would appear 63 miles per hour is about as fast as we're going to get. Now, I have to admit, that's a lot faster than I thought the car would go. Well, we never actually tested top speed on camera, but off camera, there's a good chance this car may have gone faster than, oh, I don't know, maybe 74 miles per hour. That's, of course, without all the gadgets. Okay, just for giggles, let's see how slow this car is on the 0 to 55 acceleration test. The time to beat is 20.06 seconds. Wow! Yeah, I would say this gizmo is working. It took an extra 30 seconds to get the car up to 55 miles per hour. You know, I never would have thought I'd be this happy by making a few modifications and the car actually got slower. Obviously, the goal is always to go faster, but keep in mind, we now have the ability to make the car go fast or slow with some clever software. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, well, the fuel rack limiter has to come back out so it can be modified with a longer rod and it has to be bench calibrated again. The temporary tweak that I did to the code works, but it screws up everything else at the same time. I prefer not to rely on a software fix to correct a hardware problem, if that makes any sense. Even though the software is totally screwed up at the moment, off camera, I did verify that the rack limiter will move with the pressure of the governor acting on it. And what that means is, I can floor the accelerator and twist the knob back and forth for more or less power and the engine responds accordingly. So the fuel rack limiter does indeed work to some degree, and I think now we need to focus on adding additional sensors to the engine so a microprocessor will have enough data to automatically set the boost and the fuel trim so our old school diesel engine can appear to be a normal engine when we attempt to drive this car in a big city. That'll be interesting. Well, it was a short week due to the power outage and the troubles we were initially having with the fuel rack gizmo. Perhaps now is a good time to end the video, and I'll see you next time. Until then.